Breathing first. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to keep the frame rate up. I have my suspicions this evening, I'm afraid, because um, there's a lot going on here, and I'm worried about the bandwidth, and I've had some issues today. So, it's a warning. Um, sorry that it's Friday and not Wednesday as well. I do apologise. Wednesday was really busy here. My eldest, um, it was her birthday. So we had all sorts going on. And I knew it would just be an epic fail if I tried to do a stream. Just waiting for folks to connect. Who we've got this evening. Welcome everyone. I'm literally just setting up. Um, right, so the Tussie. Um, Mm -hmm. Right, let me just set up a folder here. We're going to need this. My studio is reminding me that I need to update the latest. I'm not going to do that right now, just in case I break everything. Uh, sparkles, what is it? Hmm? What's the problem, Sparks? Hmm? How can we help you? Let's just bring my notes up as well. Um, bear with me. So that 
we can see what we're going to cover. Actually, the bit rate's keeping up at the moment, which is good. I'm a bit worried about uh, a bit worried about it today because um, uh, it's been a bit um, up and down today. Right. So let me get my notes. There we go. Let me just share this with you guys. It might help. So this is what we're going to tackle today. Um, can you read that? Let me know uh, if that's too small. I don't know if I can increase the size of this preview. Oh, that's very interesting. Why does it make that one and two and both of those one and two? <laughs> that's really weird. Am I doing the markdown wrong on this? Well, maybe it's because there's an outline inside of an outline. Possibly. I meant that zero. It still comes up as one. <laughs> oh, if I just do dot, no. whatever interesting little bug so uh, let's cover some basics then so um uh yeah forum stuff down at the mystorm forum uh one of the threads oh, one minute windows is complaining let me just fix this So uh, one of the um, threads was about doing SOC on the black ice. Um, let me tell you who that was. Here is the thread list. <sighs> Typical. Um, this one was really more aimed at Laurie than anyone else. Um, Almeja, Almeja, ha, Spanish name, I guess. Um, was asking about doing SOCs on the Black Ice MX, and the um, I'll give you the URL for that for it. Uh, Laurie had done a lot of the porting, so he talked about um, the various SOC options. I mean, this was actually an older um, thread, I think. I look about the original day. Yeah, and it's just been brought forward. I think... Um, there was just some differences to what had been written in some of the older threads about getting the SOC running and online documentation and such. Um, but by the looks of it, um, what's interesting is I think Almeja had written a Python script wrapper for the right flash stuff. Um, to make it a bit more flexible, which was quite interesting. Um, I think if Laurie's on, are you are you on the um, stream, Laurie? I see what you said here is I did take a brief look at writing a Python wrapper like the one you write, Flash. 
but uh, what I had was for sufficient for my needs at the time. Uh, I think the diagnostic output from right flash has some errors in it, probably due to a UR overflow. But that does not seem to affect what is actually written to the flash memory. He also mentioned that Saxon Sock has moved on a lot since his today's work on the black ice boards. Um, and you will have to change the linker script. He's also mentioning that, etc. So that was uh, an interesting thread, and I'm sure that's ongoing. Let's see how our maker does on that one. Um, One of the other threads that came up was the um, thread on the forum, which was a continuation. It was a kind of a, uh, added on to the uh, using M2 connectors and micro mod uh, thread. Uh, this one. And it talks about the, now, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. Is it CISG? CISG? Or when it CISG? Is that right? Anyone else know how to pronounce that? So it's the SYZ, SYGY uh, connector. Uh, and you can get some more details about this uh, there is a site all about this so it's a high density surface mount connector it's also high bandwidth um, so this is quite interesting um, and that that site actually says introducing sysg or sysg size g whatever an open standard for high performance peripheral connectivity. Uh, one of the big issues with um, the high frequency and um, high performance surface mount connectors, which tend to be high density as well. Let me just take this mixer level down. Just, uh, just a drop seem to be topping out it's a bit better hopefully it's not too quiet let me know if I've gone down too much um, they can be very expensive these high density connectors and um, they can always be very difficult to mount as well sometimes so anyhow what it says is an open standard for a high performance peripheral connectivity um, low cost compact High performance connector. Now I don't know what low cost is really uh, here because I haven't actually seen the pricing for these things. If anyone knows that, let me know if they've taken that look. But compact, obviously, and high performance connectors. Um, it says the pin count economizes available FPGA I/O, uh, relatively low cost cable options, and it's free to license. So I'm not quite sure what they mean by licensing. Now, I haven't looked at their details for that. But if you look at it, it's actually a bit more complicated than I imagined. So if you look at the specification page, there seems to be different kind of substandards to it. So it's not just one standard connector. Um, so the SysG standard uses a Samtec QSE 020, as does the SysG transceiver. So there's actually two completely different things here that use um, slightly different connectors. One of which is a, what they call a SysG standard, and the other they call a SysG transceiver. Um, so the standard itself is obviously broken into two, two different uh, 
completely different standards in itself. Let me just have a look, see if I can get a price on this. And if Octopart list it, I'd be intrigued to see how much these cost. So the QTE 020, so this is the peripheral side of the equation. Uh, sorry, no, yeah, the peripheral side the connector because they're different the price listing here so the Samtech QT0201 terminal strip it says it's wow well, so if you look at DigiKey Hmm. Also, don't have any stock. Um, they're saying six pounds thirty nine. Don't mind in pounds here. Let me just switch that to US dollars. Eight dollars thirty three. which to me is not low cost. I mean, if you were to put those on the board, that's really going to ramp up your costs. So it's nearly $10 if you include the VAT. Um, and that's the peripheral. So if anyone was going to build a peripheral, they'd ha instantly have like a $10 cost on their board before they bought any other components, before they paid for the PCB or any other the components. So from a cost point of view, it looks like a no-no from here. Let me see if there's any other suppliers. Samtech themselves for one-off claim. Again, nine plus dollars. If you're buying hundreds of them, you might be able to get them slightly cheaper. You can get them for about $5 if you buy them in a hundred from somewhere like Avnet. If you have an account looking at it. Uh, yeah, Arrow or $8. Samtech themselves are nine or eight dollars. Yeah, so it doesn't strike me as a particularly cheap thing to buy. And I'm not really seeing a lot of stock. Um, RS Components have got some in stock and they want eight eight dollars forty two, but you have to buy at least a hundred. It's only available in 100. Um, Mauser have them for one each, they're $10.36. So these aren't cheap, frankly. So I probably won't be using these, would be my guess. I mean, it is an interesting connector, but again, it's just very expensive. Um, and I wonder how much the other part is. So the bar, part that goes on the uh, carrier side. Wow, well, they're even more expensive. $11, $11, $13, Jesus Christ. $14 from Samtec. Yeah, no. I don't think I'm going to be using these on our standard boards. Maybe if we had a really high-end board, 
that would make sense but I think it's going to be too expensive on our boards and I don't really like that there's two different standards either it's not that helpful interesting but uh, apparently uh, Greg Davis is using this on is it butter stick um, if you're right on the stream Laurie let me know I'm pretty sure he's done a board called butter stick bear with me a stick let me just do a quick search Yes. Uh, that's his project uh, GitHub Home for Butterstick. And if you look on that board, you can see he's got three of those connectors. <laughs> so that's like, you know, if they're like 30, that's like $40 worth of connectors on <laughs> just expansion connectors before you count anything else on the board wow holy moly so yeah hmm i don't think that board's going to be particularly cheap then has he done a group buy for these yet i wonder what, what the cost is anyone knows let me know maybe i can do a search group buy but a stick group get but a stick but a stick group gets uh, there is a group get for this it's approved uh, campaign pre-launch so I don't suppose there's any pricing at this point let me give you that as well guys in case you're interested in following up it is a good board uh, the other nice thing about that is it has ethernet on it and it may even be gigabit um yeah gigabit it's a nice board but i don't think it's gonna be cheap it's gonna be a bit spinny but if you want a nice ecp5 board that may be a good way to go it's very cool right moving on then swiftly uh, unless anyone's got any anything else on that uh, subject um, what was next on the list uh, oh yes Robert Burks um, he's done his second part of his risk 5 project uh, now remember I mentioned this last week um, Robert is restarting a project he started oh some time ago or well, redoing this is like a mark 2 version because he's originally going to do basically he's building a risk 5 out of um, some fairly basic components like TTL type stuff um, you know 74 series and god knows what else and EPROMs and stuff so i mentioned it last week um so he's done another part to this which is part two um let me give you the link for that because oh, i didn't actually want to play it thank you uh here's the video for it um now it's quite fascinating what he's doing and he's he plays very loose with his clock domains, I notice in M Migen. Uh, it probably makes sense because he is putting together a bunch of stuff that isn't necessarily synchronized, and he is simulating the memory and things like that as well. So uh, he's being realistic in that sense, although he's not doing the actual timing for the chips because you can't specify the timing in M Migen model of the chips that he's using um, but again it's a nice part um, and he's getting into it quite deeply now 
and it's really quite interesting because you can see some of the things that he does with his um, with his uh, Enmigent stuff. Um, I learned a lot from Robert, quite frankly. You just take this off. We got the heating on today. thing so the other thing was there was another thread um, and it was asking about iStudio this was from a little way back and I never really had much chance to um, to do anything on this um, here's the thread but um it was dr z or dr z uh, depending where you're from and he he'd asked i just ordered black eyes mx but is it is it compatible with iStudio? i don't see it as supported in the board's iStudio menu kaimagazi and then dave david shah responded um looks like it was added here um and he points to a pull address. Um, I haven't tried it myself though. Yes, I found out, but I had to install the nightly build of ice studio. So I figured at some point I'd better go and have a look. So this week I also got a chance to um, download the nightly ice studio to replace the one that I had on my machine i haven't really used it a lot i've never been uh i've never had chance to play around with it recently uh i played around with it a long long time ago i remember when it first came out i was very interested in it and there was quite a few of the black ice users um certainly for black eyes and black eyes 2 both of which were supported on ice studio um there was quite a few folks that played around with it, it was a great little entry uh into you know fpgas and the verilog stuff so i figured i better run the latest version so um the the, sh the short take is that it it, it does support uh, black ice mx and i played around with the mx board uh this week uh in iStudio and it does work although i've hit some issues now i can't quite work out what the issues are whether they're it's to do with certain pins the pcf file and the description i mean i've been trying to work out how it all fits together the when i look at the repository for ice uh iStudio and i don't i don't have the expertise to know how it fits together uh, it's I think it's written using node JS which I have absolutely zero experience of don't have a clue and I believe node JS itself is uh, based on JavaScript so you write it's like a web app development platform uh, and you write your code using um, JavaScript. Now, the only JavaScript I've done has tended to be a a very long time ago, and b most of it was in web pages, etc. You know, in HTML pages. I've not used it to write anything serious, so my um, my skill in that department is pretty limited. But I have a trouble even just working out what the structure is when I look at the repository. It's not obvious. I can you can go in there and look at the resources. Um, let me give you the link for this actually. Um, whilst I'm here, uh, so this is the main page, Pi Studio, and then the uh, the actual code can be found on GitHub here. So if you go into the app 
subdirectory and then into resources subdirectory then boards you can see all the listed supported boards and if you look at that so for example i can look at the black ice mx uh, folder and then in there i look at the pinout pcf and that looks fine i think that's been taken from my uh from the mx repository so that looks okay but i mean the problem i was having was i was trying to use the buttons and for some reason if you look at the buttons uh, they're pin 49 and 52 but for some reason um it was using different different pins it was using the right protect and hold pins of the spy flash which were um hold on uh, pin 63, 64 and 63. Uh, and the reason I know that is because I output the Verilog that it produces. And it had those defined in there. So I don't quite know why that was doing that. Because as I say, the PCF looks fine. I'm just wondering. So that PCF gets converted maybe into the pinout.json. So if I look at the buttons, yeah. So somewhere in that conversion process, it's got broken because if you look at the pinout.json file in that directory, um, B2 is defined as pin 64 and B1 is 63, which is obviously wrong because those are the pins for the um, for the spike so i mean i assumed it converted the pcf file but clearly it doesn't it must be done manually and uh, maybe that's got um, uh, correct so i actually filed an issue on that um, i probably need to check the rest of them as well i don't know if that's been looked Looked at. I haven't seen any response on that. Hold on. No. So my issue. If you see any issues when you actually play around with iStudio, do do file them. And um, one of the guys on the team may well fix them. Um, they're at 0.3.3 or something, I think, at the moment, version-wise. So anyhow, so there are some issues. I mean, it's working, but I think the issues are possibly down to um, the manual conversion to those JSON files. Um, but it's working. Um, so let's just that's a good segue to start doing some work so one of the things i thought i'd do is let's use iStudio to do what we did last week in nmigen um before we carry on extending the nmigen version because i think it's useful um to understand to see it from different points of view so the mmigen point of view is using M it's using Python. Whereas if you're in iStudio, there are blocks which you can drag and drop and you can connect together, as you'll see in a minute. If, if you haven't seen it before, you, you might quite like it. But it very much has this idea of blocks and you can pre-make these blocks. Um, however, the blocks themselves probably need some Verilog in many cases, whether you're writing it or whether someone else is writing it. So it's kind of the Verilog side of the fence. So if I just remind you what we did last week, um, so we, we're now here, by the way, on the agenda. So let me just mark this time code. Um, 34 minutes. I did promise I'd do this. I should have marked those individual other ones as well. Damn it, I forgot. 34. 
So, um, save that. Let's open, let, just to remind you where we were. So on the stepper, the stepper itself was very simple. Um, and we will come back to this later because we want to extend it. We had created effectively, um, this is the main meat of the stepper. Um, so here it was basically creating a switch um, matching each sequence to the phase. Now sequence is a free bit that goes from zero to seven. So it's eight different stages of moving the stepper motor through uh, through its cycles. Um, just to remind you what that looks like. Uh, logic, let me just see if I can open this up. So there are four lines driving the unipolar. So if we look at the output of those, um, what you see is this kind of phased turning on of the coils, which is kind of just gently rotating the magnetic field in the stepper motor. So this is what we, uh, when we go through the sequence, we're talking about an eight step sequence. Now, normally it'd just be, if it was four steps, it's just four phases um, where you're switching on each of the segments, the combinations of the coil segments. But because we're half stepping, i.e. we want smooth resolution, we get twice the resolution, um, which is a 3.75 degrees, I think, on these motors internally in the motor. Um, before the gearing, um, that requires eight half steps to get through uh, the repeating cycle. So what you see on the logic capture, if I bring it up, hold on, uh, here, is you see this um, If I can make that a bit bigger, no, make it wider but not bigger. So you have this um, kind of stepped sequence. Where the coils are energized in sequence. So that is created. Um, By effectively creating a switch so what we're doing is we're rotating through the sequences we're going from 0 to 7 and as we do that so for each of those there is an individual case just turn this off temporarily otherwise you won't see the code in fact what we do here this is temporarily disable the analyzer so on this code itself what that switch case is doing is it's um it basically is using python to do the uh enumeration of the phases it's using uh four in phases if so i'll just remind you the, what what phases is is basically this so here we have sequence on the left hand side going from zero to seven that's the that's the seven different states and here are the cascading outputs in this column or in low level a b c d logic levels so this is what we're going to recreate, but we're going to do it uh, in iStudio. So let me um, see if I can bring that up first. It's probably the best thing. Fun, fun, fun. Let me make this a bit bigger and get this on the screen.
Okay, so the first thing to notice is um, I'm just going to make myself. Oh, I made that a bit wide. Hold on. First thing to notice is this now has a dark theme. You can actually select a theme. And that's very, very cool. I like that. I'm into dark themes. Let me just show you what I mean here. Where do I set this up? Is it under view? No. <clears throat> Crikey. Preferences. What do you reckon? Yeah, UI theme. Uh, no, I don't want to restart. Okay, you'll have to take my word for it. No, it used to be dark. Uh, sorry, white. Okay, so uh, the other thing to look at down in this bottom corner here where you see the arrow, it tells you what board it thinks that it's going to be talking to. So normally that would say... Black Eyes MX, for example. Now in this case, because I've got our stepper project set up on hardware um, with alloy, um, I need to use a nice 40 up 5K. And of course, alloy isn't in ice studio yet. And rather than try and work out how to get that in immediately, which I did have a look at, but failed miserably, um i'm just going to use an existing one so we're using the icebreaker here and then i'm going to use the icebreaker pinouts which are going to be slightly different but at least it has the same chip okay so what are we going to need first hold on we are going to need a clock input Uh, we won't be able to use the built-in clock pin, which is defined in um, Icebreaker, because that's on a different pin from the one that we happen to be using on the Alloy. So I'm going to choose, I've already looked it up, that's the same as button free. it's the same uh, input. So this is the first thing that you find in Ice Studio, is you've got a kind of graphical user environment. Um, which I think is very cool and it's great for people coming to things for the first time particularly if you've already got modules that you need to experiment you can think of it as a kind of visual uh, FPGA tool which is kind of cool right so that's that's going to be generating our clock input Oh, hi, Laurie, by the way, I didn't realize that you come online. Uh, I tried recent iStudio on the ULX 3S board, but the buttons did not work correctly on that. But for another reason, I missed the start of this stream. So I was just looking back at what you have covered. Uh, I ordered the motors and the chip that you were using and they arrived today. Well, that's great because you'll be able to do some of this afterwards. Um, what I'm going to be doing here runs on the icebreaker. If you, I think you've got an icebreaker as well, so you could always try and run it on there if you need to. Um, but my pinouts are slightly different. But anyhow, we haven't done much. We did some news earlier. Um, covered some of the other things. There's some notes. Um, bear with me a sec. Let me just, let me just, hmm, what is it called this? We'll just turn iStudio off for a second, just to remind you, Laurie, um, what we had was, this was what we covered earlier. So on the news stuff, I talked about the SOC thread um where folks were asking about the um 
SOC on the Black ISMX. Uh, I talked about what I think is Suzji. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Turns out they look, look quite expensive when I looked at the pricing. The ones on the carrier are like 13 or 14 dollars, and if you want to do a peripheral, it's 10 or 11 dollars. Some some of them down as low as nine. If you're willing to like buy hundreds, then you can get them down to eight dollars or less. But again, very expensive. Also mentioned that Robert's um, done his part two of his Elmarv, and then I went on to the iStudio stuff because originally this was one of the threads on uh, on the forum that I hadn't responded to, and I actually had a chance to do that this week. So let me just switch back. So that's just a quick update for those that missed it earlier. So um, what I'm going to be doing is recreating what we did last week on the stepper uh, in iStudio, and then we go on back to NMyGen to um, to do the extra bits and pieces that we the part two if you like so that's where we are um, so what we're going to need is an input clock um, I'm doing this separately because our clock comes in on a different pin to the icebreaker so I'm separating that out yeah I mentioned the butter stick when you go back uh, and review the earlier parts of the stream you'll see that I mentioned that he's effectively got about $40 worth of connectors just on the carrier um, it's a cool thing and I, I posted links already for the um, for the project page for the butter stick and the group gets the butter stick there's no pricing on the group gets for that yet Greg Devil's board so anyhow we're gonna need the button Sorry, we're going to need the clock, and I know that comes in on the same pin that he classifies as button free on the uh, icebreaker. The reason I'm using the icebreaker here is because we've got the same chip on alloy, and we don't have a board file yet. Um, there are issues with the pin numbering um, that may be causing your ULX 3S problem, but it could be something else because I discovered something else playing around with the alloy today, which was a bit weird. Um, and I need to double check that. It doesn't look like the conversion from PCF to their JSON file is automated because it's it's wrong. The JSON does not follow the uh, PCF file. There are mistakes. So we're going to need the clock, um, and then we're going to need afterwards. We're going to need a step up. But let's just do the. So let's create. Um, we're going to do use code um, because there isn't one. Uh, so we're going to call this stepper or uni stepper. Um, in fact, that's that's one of the issues with this. This isn't the name of this block. Um, the input ports, so, so I'm going to need a clock, I'm going to need step, and I'm going to need DIR. And these can be lowercase. Uh, output ports, I need. A, B, C, and D. Don't need any parameters in this case. Okay. Um, so Laurie is saying um, the problem with the ULX3 in iStudio is it doesn't have the pull down support, which ECP5 can do. Um, ECP5 support in the iStudio looks new and not very complete. Yeah, quite possibly. So uh, the first thing we're going to need here is we're going to need what 
What are we going to need? We are going to need, I just need to look at my code from the MyGen stuff. <sighs> right, we're going to need a register for the sequence, just like we had in the MyGen. So this will go from 0 to uh, 7. So we're going to need effectively 3 bits. Um, And initially we can have that equal to zero. The other thing we're going to need is the phase. Oops. And the phase is going to be four bits. And again, we can, we, I don't think we need to set that. We're going to set that straight away from the sequence anyhow. Uh, what else are we going to need? Just, we're probably going to need to synchronize the... Um, well, let's, let's just do this bit first. We'll look at doing the step afterwards. Uh, so we're going to need that. Uh, our outputs here will need to be converted. So let's do an assign from our phase to those outputs. I want them separate on the output because I want to be able to set them separately. It will make sense in a minute. So, in fact, it's probably easier. Let's just define those first. Basic. So we're going to need four outputs. We're going to need A. We're going to need B. And we will need D. And then very easy. Oops, you just connect them up. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Look at that. How easy is that? And then we can straighten things up. Now, uh, this will need to be, uh, I wrote these down, pin, for the right pin here, it's pin A9, 1A9, I think it was, 1A9. A10, 1A9, and the next one would be 1A10, 1A10. Uh, and then there's a quirk. I know when I tested these earlier, there's a bit of a quirk. That happens to be on an LED pin on um, on the Bryce Breaker design. And then the other one was the 1B2, 1B2, it was 1B2, that one. Okay, so those are the outputs that I've connected to the motor. Um, so in order to drive those, I need to do a, a combinational i.e. an always, sorry, a permanent connection, if you like, from the concatenation Oops. from the phase output. Don't forget the semicolon. Trouble is, if you've been writing Python a bit, which I have recently, you start forgetting those little ones. Uh, you can't see what I'm typing at the moment. Agenda screen is in the right. Oh, I do apologize. My bad. That's what I've done. So I'll show you what we did to connect these up. So all I did was create an output, whatever it might be, 
yeah and then you select which pin you want it to go to which i've done on here and then you just connect those up and then i'm going to be continually driving these so it's combinational so whatever the phase is any time drives the concatenation of a b c and d i.e pin bits one from the MSB to the LSB. Can you see that now? Is that um, is that readable as well, guys? Damn it! My tea is empty. I started it early. Oh, you can see it. Cool. We like that. And he can read it. Yes, good. Thank you, Laurie. Anyone else? Um, so that's that. Then, um, then we're going to need Norway's block. Um, on the incoming clock. Let's just hook that up as well before I forget. So this is our incoming clock. Um, again, and so I'll do a typo. Begin. Okay. Um, there's a great thing here, actually. If I do do a typo like that, if I do verify, I should pick that up. I think it internally it installs um, iVeriLog, which it uses to detect things. So here you can immediately see some issues or oh, invalid module item invalid module item hold on let's say that hmm. strange um so it's what it's got a problem with that yes because i've got an extra equals here which is good so it does give you some help, which is kind of nice. So if I do a verification again and see it's picking up this begin here, syntax error. Um, I don't, can you see the pop-ups? Do they come out as I hover? Not all pop-ups do. I know when I'm using IntelliJ, the pop-ups aren't visible on the OBS for some strange reason. I think they're popping up on OBS. Can you just confirm that? Are you seeing the pop-up that in this case it says syntax error? All right, can you see that? Cool, good. The pop-ups are showing. Okay, so let me correct that. And then when I do the uh, verify again. Oh, always. <laughs> Ah, there we go. Verification done. We've got a green light. Look. Um, so in here, what what I want to do is I want to do a. Um, this is a bit more convoluted, um, because. Uh, mm, because we're in, we're, we're using Verilog here. We don't have the nice shortcuts that we get for generating the switch case type scenario that you get in um, uh, in Mygen because it uses Python. So we have to manually do this. So I'm just gonna go and copy that actually from. Uh, the stepper. So this is going to be very badly formatted. Oh, damn it. Yeah, it's got spaces. So, oh, it's annoying. So first of all, that's not right. It's got to be one B. It's going to look like that, isn't it? A 
and that's got to look like it's going to be one, oh, four bits mm. like that so they've all got to look like that so let's just convert all these first quicker to type them quite frankly still there you go famous last words Same there. Yeah, I mean, you've just got a little editor window here, so you can't use any of your special editor tricks to do this trick either, unfortunately. Hey ho. Oh, and these. <laughs> oh, yes, this is not a list anymore. A dictionary. These are individual cases that have to be terminated with a semicolon. Oh, it would have been quicker just to type the damn thing up in the whole. Trouble is, typing binary is really, really slow. It's so easy to make a mistake. Okay, let's just do a quick uh, verify. Oh, it's warning me. What's it warning me about? Extra digits given to the size binary constant. Extra digits. Oh, yeah. No. God, of course. Yes, it's not one at all. Uh, oh, that is selecting those. But can I... Can I select all of those? No, if I select one, can I replace all? I want to change that to um, three. Is there a way of doing all of that? Maybe there is a way. Maybe there's some tricks in this editor that I'm unaware of. Control, shift three, maybe? Or alt free. No. Shift free. No. Damn it. I do them manually. It did seem to um, highlight them all. There must be a way of using that columnar highlighting or common highlighting. But I don't know the quick key for it. Okay, that looks better. Three, four. So, what's it complaining? Syntax error. Mm. Oh, I need an end case. Mm, what am I missing here? God, it's been a while since I've written Devilog. I've had my head in my gym for the last few weeks. What am I doing wrong here? Okay. And then... Let's 
assigning that value, I'm assigning this. So in that case, I'm assigning this value. Mm -hmm. What am I missing here? What does it like? I missed a semicolon somewhere else. <sighs> what am I doing? Doesn't it like? Hmm. Let's just zoom in a little bit here. Make it easier for you guys to see. Um. I mean, I could do maybe that's what it doesn't like, possibly. Uh -huh. Why is it saying that there's a syntax error there? Hey, do not understand. Posage. Why is that posage? Hmm. I don't know if that makes any difference, Laurie. Still having the same problem, even with a space after that. I've got a space in between the two, even. It's not making any difference. I don't understand what it's tripping up on. And why is it saying there's a syntax error here? There's nothing on that line. Maybe that's because of this here, because it's not seeing that. There's a separate... Um, so I'm doing the shortcut. So now it thinks you see it's moving this stuff down, but it's line eight that's always got the error. Um, I think what makes this more difficult is it's reading back the syntax error from the Verilog that it compiles, which isn't just this Verilog, but it's the outer Verilog as well that includes everything else we've joined up here. Um, it's one of the issues that I have with iStudio that. Um, Uh, can cause all sorts of problems. That should actually be one of those. But what syntax error? That's not making a great deal of sense to me. Nothing wrong with the assign A, B, C, D. We can see those phase, right? Equals phase, 
phase is being set on the pause edge of this clock. Damn, this is weird. Hmm, this is a little bathroom. These are all different. Yeah, they're all unique, so it can't be that. But why is it saying the syntax error is here? That's just like... And if I put that there, and then actually take these out, <laughs> it puts it here. I mean, that's just baffling. There, there's something else going on here that it's got a problem with in its output file that we're not seeing i think it's gotta be but what the hell is it okay oh, i wonder what can we look at the verilog Wow. Oh, you want to go out, do you? Sparks, bear with me a sec, sweetheart. I just got to find this file. Oh, when I was using it earlier in the week, it wasn't this bad. I don't know why this is having such an issue. Uh, Oh, these are arranged. Oh, why can't I see it? That's oh, a bloody folder. What? It's really not very helpful. Open. I can see it now, that's really weird. Maybe it just needed a refresh. So let's have a look at this. Um, and at the same time, we can deal with. Want to go out, Sparks? Are you happy there? Um, my biggest problem, separate to the issue that we're currently having, is when it starts connecting all these bits of Verilog together magically, you know, so when you've drawn those connections, it invents these links and it just creates these horrible numbers. So trying to read the output Verilog is very, very difficult. Look how anonymized it all is. It's very difficult to actually read. Uh, apparently, Laurie's reproducing what I have. He's running this simultaneously. Oh, I know what it could be. Hold on, hold on. Let's just go back. I can see a mistake. 
Um, turn this back on so that you guys can see it. Missing a semicolon on the last item. <laughs> Still got a mistake. Maybe this is a different one. Hold on. Syntax error. Same campaign. Oh, it's annoying. Anyway, so let's just go back to where we were. Let's just reproduce that Verilog output. Export. Verilog. So, yes, place it. Let's just turn it back off. Back to here. Hmm. Reload your bugger. Why is it not? That's interesting. How do I get this to reload? Oh, God, this is frustrating. Uh, yeah, I can show you. Um, let's turn this back on. So, yeah, to create a, a code block, uh, Laurie, you just go up to basic, choose code, and then you just got to enter in a list of the input comma separated list of the input ports and a comma separated list of the output ports and that will create an empty code block for you um, what's puzzling me as Mr Jagger would say the nature of this error why is it saying syntax error there I that's baffling me god it shouldn't be this hard uh, let me get rid of that in case it doesn't like that I don't think it is but Hold on, build. Unexpected dollar end. What? There's a begin and an end. My studio isn't showing code block template correctly. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that means. I. So what happens? Does does it just not bring up an empty code window, or when you do code block? When I was playing with this earlier, I wasn't getting any of these errors. I was having a couple of issues with um, pin mappings and stuff. is kind of weird why is it right let me just also whilst i'm at it rebuild this ferrolog output because i want to have a look at that Bear with me a sec
well it's not changed the output i go and look at that Verilog that I've supposedly just created. It's not updated. Let me just do it one more time. Export Verilog. Save. Replace. Maybe I didn't choose replace. Then I look at file. I open it. And it's not changed. Mmm. Interesting. Hold on, let me just go and look at the date timestamp of that file in PowerShell. Oh, it doesn't do minus LA, does it? LS. It says stepper.v was changed at 21.25. So it's updated the file, but I've added this, this comma here. Hmm. Right, let me go out and come back in maybe. Hold on. Will that work? This is a nightly build, so maybe it's just, you know, having a bit of a teething problem. Let me rerun it. <laughs> now I run it and it just seems to be stuck. Just a nice white screen look. Mm. Laurie says, I think I need a more recent nightly build. What do you mean a more recent nightly build? Nightly build should be nightly. Or are you using like an old nightly? I'm using the nightly from yesterday, I think. Or whenever I was last playing with it. Uh, you've got an old one. Yeah, you probably want to get a newer one. Trouble is, when I run iStudio now, <laughs> it's, it's just coming up with a white screen. It's not... Um... Oh, there we go. It's open this time. Wow, it seems to be really flaky at the moment. I mean, it is nightly after all, so goodness knows what... Uh... Zeus and Co are doing. Let me try and open. I wish it had a recent list. It's loaded the project this time. Ah, uh, yeah, it hasn't changed it. It wasn't saving the changes I made before. Look. At some point, it stopped saving the changes. I really wish I knew how to change all of these at once. How do you change all of those at once? It does select them in a columnar way. Is there a, some sort of key you have to press to make that work? Because it knows to, that it could change them all. Clock again, says. Semicolon. Save. Right now, let's do a build. Oh, it's had a problem with the end. What's it saying here? Syntax error around this line. Uh, look at the typo. There's two R's in the around. Um, <clears throat> why is that? Begin case sequence end. Why, 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 why is that? Let's just build again. Let's 
So there's the begin. There's the end. You just do um, an export as well or something like that. Now when I look at the Verilog in the editor that has updated this time. Oh, I know what I'm missing. I'm being an idiot. I did fix it last time round, but because it wasn't saving, it forgot and didn't have that in it. So now I do a save and I do a build. Could we get a clean bill of health? Build done. Right, let's do a verify. Look at that. We're all green. Right. Output ports work, but I have to type blindly into an unlabeled block. Well, oh, maybe have you selected the right board? Uh, Laurie, so under I think you have to uh, select the right board under here, make sure that it's ticked. I don't know what you've got because I'm using icebreaker here because I'm working on the alloy, it's the same, same chip. The pin names and that are different. I have to go and look in the icebreaker PCF file and convert them, which is why these have got such odd names here. But they're the same pin on the FPGA. So when you go to an output like that, so did you just did you choose output? So you know you get an output like that you plonk it down and then you click from this list Did, does that list not pop up for you sorry so that you can select is that what you're saying <clears throat> i was doing the code block not the output all right, so you're talking about this. So when you type in here, you can't see what you're, what you've typed. Is it, it is it that you're not seeing what you're typing in the code block? Oh, I see what you mean. So yeah, when I do choose code here, make sure you choose code, not information. There, you mean, you're not getting that dialogue. Or you can't, when you type into it, you can't see it. Like that. Only the first label. You don't get that happening. Only input ports. Wow. Ah, that's weird. So you're only seeing this one here and you're not seeing these options. Oh. That's strange. What are you running on? Are you running on um, on Linux? Sorry. You see the fields, but not the labels. Okay, so when you do that, you're not seeing this bit, but you're seeing the thing that you can enter in. So you could still enter the details. It's just you're not seeing these, the stuff in white, right? Virtual box, Ubuntu for Windows. All right, so you're running a virtual Ubuntu 
and the windows rather than using the windows ones. Okay, you might want to just try the windows one. Anyhow, so that's where we are with these. So that now compiles. Um, I say compiles, that verifies, I mean, it builds and verifies. The other thing we're going to need here is a clock divider. Um, so I'm going to copy that. I mean, they, they do have one, but it's, it's actually wired to... Um, To the clock so I can't actually bloody change it which is annoying but you can actually go in and edit this so I'm just going to go in and thieve the code it's all pretty straightforward anyhow and I'm going to get rid of that and I'm going to enter a new code block and the input is going to be clock and the output is going to be step so I want to generate some steps oh, I keep doing the caps thing not good for very long. Uh, yeah. Do that. And hold on. Paste that in, and I do need parameter n the divider so that can go there and then i can connect this up and i need to move some things around a bit here i'm going to connect the output this clock into here and then what this does is it divides so yeah, you're not going to see much of this. Oh, damn, that's awkward. Hmm. The wiring here is a bit of a nightmare. Right, so I make that wider now so that you can see it. It's going to be off the page. Uh, let me see if I can. I want to blow opening this damn thing. Right. Let's do let's just change this direction, the order of this, and if this will work. <laughs> totally confused it now. Right, okay. Um, It is a bit fiddly, to be fair. <laughs> oh my god! Can I um, yeah, manually adjust this? Right, bit ugly. it in so we can see what's going on here pre-scale parameter and yeah 
let's do that basic let's add um Where do we do our um constant that's it. Divide by 15, I think we were using. So here I'm just using a um, a constant of 15. I called it 15, didn't I? Twat. Divide power. Right. So this is basically we'll divide the clock by two to the fifteen. That's what all we're doing here. So it's going to send a step every two to the fifteen clocks into here. So um, step-wise, let's just bring this down a bit. You can't move those like that. Maybe I can. Oh. It's all changed, not just that. Okay. This takes a little bit of getting used to. I'm driving like a clumsy idiot. Do forgive me. Um, shame you can't move this down to the bottom, really. So what we're going to do here is we need to synchronize the incoming um, uh, step to the clock to get them in the same clock domain uh, step. Let's call it step synchronized. Oh, can't type to do. So what we do is we do this old trick. We do PS, which is a synchronized version of step, we um, load that from the concatenation of whatever it was before plus the incoming state of the step. So that would be STPS0, is it? Uh, comma, and then step, which is the incoming signal here. That's actually kind of naught, comma, naught, isn't it, I guess? I think it's the same thing. To build doesn't ah oh, semicolon. Damn it, too long in Python. Oh, oh! Once it's got redded like that, you can't seem to click outside, which means you can't save. That is the problem. That's why we can't make any changes. I build again. Still got an error. Oh, sorry. 
Alright, we now have two cats in the room. I'm going to get double hassled. In fact, this one was sleeping until I just um, booted it, unfortunately. It's this it doesn't like. Ah. Yes, wrong clock. Uh, that's the output step, isn't it? Okay, that builds. Let's verify. Oh, it verifies as well. We must be on a roll here, guys. Right. So that's good. Let's make this a bit um, shorter, actually. We can put things onto the screen a little bit better. It is a bit of a mess. You can't make it come out the other side, really. Annoying. Very annoying. Okay. Well, we just have to put up with the ugliness, I'm afraid. Knowing though that is. Now the other thing here is we need a uh, direction, uh, so we just need a constant for that. Let's just have that high for a moment. So we now ready to rock and roll. So. Am I missing anything? So what I can do now is export this as a bit stream. Normally what you do at this stage, you just do upload. But in this case, because it thinks it's an icebreaker, it will try and talk to an FTDI, which I haven't set up. Uh, and because we're using the alloy, we just need the file. So all we do is we do Export bitstream. So we're exporting the bitstream here, and then I'm going to put it straight onto the alloy. Just connect it up. Circuit Pi, and then on here, see there's a logic. We're going to replace that file. Yes, replace that file. And it does absolutely nothing. Okay, well, that's not too bad because I obviously haven't done anything with this yet. So what I need to do now, let me just zoom in so you guys can see this. So I'm going to, um, now that I've got a synchronized step signal, um, I need to the other thing I need to do is if STPS is equal to 
uh, to be pure one. So this is the synchronized input. So it, it's got two bits. The most recent state of the step and then the previous state. Remember, we're shifting those in here to synchronize them. And what I'm saying is if the state of this synchronized is zero, 01, that means it was zero and there's now one. That means it's on a positive edge. So in other words, if there's a step coming in, then we can do, so if we ignore the direction uh, for the moment, we can do uh, sequence is now going to become updated to what it was before plus one on the previous clock cycle. But that's going to, hmm, hold on, that's just going to, that should be okay, actually. Uh, I need a semicolon there. Build. Let's verify. I seem to be happy with that. So if I now output the bit file. Save that onto D drive, it should reload. It stops what it was doing. I'm not seeing anything happening on here. I guess I'd better show you guys. Uh, hold on, take the lens cap off the camera, it's always really helpful to do that, I find. Um, it's just, this is always quite tricky. Oh, there's something happening. It's a bit jumpy. I'll come back to that in a minute. I just feel there's something going on here. Let me do a quick... There's, there is something happening because I saw it move just then, but it's not quite right. Let's have a quick look with the... Um, There's the uh, desktop, by the way, guys. I can feel some vibration in here. Um, I don't know. This will pick it up. This is too low frequency. Um, But it's always good. I always do that. I put my finger on it and feel it. Because even if it's not stepping correctly, you might feel something going on inside. And there's definitely something going on. Um, let's do a quick um, logic capture as well. And see what we can see. See if that gives us any clues. Do a capture. I saw this problem once before when I was messing with Studio. So, right, if you look carefully at the signal, can you see the offsets on the logic analyzer here? So, there's your first on. 
peak on peak. Can you see how they've got them stretched out? They don't look linear. It's because two of these are actually swapped. This one and this one should be in a different order. This was the problem I was having with the pins earlier. And I bet it's because I changed them round. So I need to swap these back round. So that's P1, B2. P1, B2. P1, B2. Remember when I was looking on the logic analyzer earlier, I had this problem. It's really odd. P1, B2. I make this one the LED. It's a very strange issue. I don't quite get what's going on. And then I rebuild. And then I'm going to export the bitstream again. replace the existing one uh, no, I'm getting nothing oh uh, I haven't changed anything else, have I? Uh, it's just really slow. It's working now. Yay, so they're now in a nice sequence. Had two of those around the wrong way. Um, Let's switch over to here and you'll see. Ta da! Voila! It'll work. That's good. Uh, Laurie's asking a question. Uh, Laurie Griffiths, can I select a code block and edit the input ports? It, what you need to do is if you go onto the code block, Laurie, like this, double click on it. Yeah. So when the cursor changes from uh, something you can insert your code on, so if you go to the edge of it, your cursor changes to like a, um, oh shit, sorry. Let me get the right screen. And let me just turn off the logic analyzer. Right, so when you get to the code block, if can you see how the cursor changes when you get to the, the edge or the corner? Changes from a carrot type insert when you're in there and then it goes to this if you go to the corner you get like a right click thing so you can change the size but if you double click on it when it's in that state then it brings up the dialogue that you started with when you created the code sequence and then you can go in and change stuff is that what you're asking can i select the code block and edit the input box is that what you were asking Laurie? Does that work for you? But does it actually work for you? Does it bring it up? And are you still missing the labels when you do that? Oh, so does that mean that you, you can see the labels now? It's an interesting bug if that's the case. This is like a screen refresh bug or something maybe. So anyhow, that's now working. Uh, have you got the same code running in your window? Have you kept up? I can always paste this to you somehow. Use a gist or something. Still missing labels. <laughs> that's got to be a screen bug. Maybe it's because you're running in a virtual machine. Or maybe it's a bug with the Linux version.
Uh, I don't know. Can I do a... How do you get a new gist? New gist. Hold on. There you go, Laurie. Do you want to do some copying and pasting? I'll add another bit in for the... Um, for the divider as well as a comment. Does that help, mate? <laughs> yes, but you can run it on Icebreaker. Yeah, you'll have to change the pins. But you can do that, you know, when you get a moment or when you get bored with what I'm doing. So the next bit I was going to do, um, so this is only going in one direction. We're not taking any notice of the direction. So really what we want to do is look at the direction. So the direction is one. We want to go in that direction else. What we want to do is make the sequence go in the opposite direction. So it'd be seek, oops, seek minus one. So we're decrementing the sequence rather than incrementing the sequence. Let me just uh, verify that. Yeah. So now when I save this, it should do the same thing. Um, so we haven't actually changed anything because direction is one in this case. Sometimes it does take ages to do the update. It gets its knickers in a right twist. I haven't quite worked out why that is. It's not loose wire, is it? Yeah. Sometimes it's a loose wire, I think. Um, but now, so that's doing what it should do. So if we go back the CAD, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change this constant to zero. Oh, I can't because it's a constant. I can cut it though. Oh, you can't do delete on this, it's really annoying, but I can cut and then I can add a zero in instead of a one. So now, when we do the build, we should move in the other direction. Export bitstream. Output that. Oh, 
Oh, I didn't realise that had a switcher as well. Come on, what's going on? Oh dear. There we go. Now it's going clockwise. It was anti-clockwise last time, wasn't it? I guess the other thing we could do is we could use another divider like we're doing here. Uh, code. Uh, step. And the output's going to be DIR. Rather than having this be here, what we're going to do is oh, so we're going to do this. We're going to divide. This time we're going to divide the steps down. Uh, I N. So um, it takes 1024 steps to go round. So if I do 512 steps, it'll go. Well, let's let's because the it's 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 64 steps in the revolution, but the, it also has a gear in there of one in 16. So it's one oh two four steps to go all the way round. Um, so it's not because this is the power of two, it's gonna be um eight ten bits effectively. I'm going to take the step output here. God, that's ugly. I'm going to have that going to here. So for every round circle, it should change direction. Possibly. Let me just do a. Ah. Uh, uh, it's actually step in this case and DIR output. Let's build this verify. Let's export that. Sorry guys, we seem to have had a disconnect. But it seems to have reconnected. It does get its knickers in the twist occasionally. <clears throat> I 
I'm not seeing any direction changes here. Uh, let me check. So I'm taking a step into here, DIR into there. Oh, it stopped. It's going again. Hmm. Maybe I need to synchronize it with the clock. Okay, did the other step. Uh, let me just be sure that I am using the current one. Ah, twat, wrong name, it's not called cool step, I need to call it logic.bin, otherwise CircuitPython doesn't pick it up, script, bear with, doesn't normally take this long to reload, I wonder if the clock rate's low on there for some reason. So just to show you, sorry, what I've done is I've added this here. So I've taken a step signal into here, and I've divided it into the DIR signal. I've divided by 2 to the 10, effectively. It's working. <clears throat> but it's only doing like an eighth of a turn. Hmm. Maybe I've done my maths wrong. I mean, it's doing what it should do, but, um, hmm. Uh, what's Laurie saying? Not sure that the iStudio GUI helps very much when you need to run so much Verilog. That's very true. Um, I mean, it's kind of a block is really enabling you to treat it like a module to once you've created a block. So, yeah, let me go back because this is important. So on here, each of these is blocks. What you should be able to do is, you know, select one of these and save it as a block, I reckon. So I should be able to select that and somehow save that. We've got add as a block, which brings something in. I don't think I can, if I do save as now, it's going to save the whole thing, you see. But from within here, it'd be nice to turn that into a block. Yeah. Um, so if I just show you what I mean, this will work. If I do a new window,
I'm going to save that one. And I'm going to create a new one. So I'm going to do it the way that you should do it. I mean, you should be able to do it from within there, be able to save from a selection, but you, you can't seem to do that. So what you have to do is you do this. So if I create, what did I have before? I had step, clock, and dir, okay. And the output was a, b, c, d. And there wasn't any parameters. And I've just copied and pasted that code. I just wrote. Okay. Yeah. And then what I can do is I can save that. So I'm going to save that as step a block well in fact before i do that this is another awkward thing you need to set up like some things for this to be useful so i go i need to go to um project information so I'm going to have this as a step of block version one Let's say a uh, step a block for unipolar was it 28 YBJ or something, whatever they call it. Name. And then I need some sort of um, SVG file that will represent it. Uh, hold on. Mm. It might be a bit big. Yay, look at that. Okay. So I then do a save as, and I call this stepper uh, block. Can do a new file so let's get rid of that one so now in my new one what i can do is i can add as a block 
and I've just opened there and I bring that in as a block how cool is that but clearly I need the other bits as well like the divider and stuff like that uh, now where are my connectors oh wait uh, I can't see any of my inputs and outputs though. It's a nice, nice looking image. Um, yeah, as Laurie says, it makes more sense if you're going to reuse them. Yeah, or if you had a library of them i guess but all it's really doing is just wiring those pieces together isn't it it's not it's not helping you create them that much but it's helping you reuse them i guess and that's kind of the missing part it's not you know why can't i see any connectors on here though that's confused me a bit I've got a picture, but how do I connect something up? So if I was to try and add my clock here. There's something really wacky going on with the uh, sizing. <laughs> uh, maybe that's what the problem is. Maybe it's just too small. But SVG I am um, made. What the hell is going on here? Why is this like? <laughs> I, think, I think I've got some sort of bug as well, Laurie. I mean, why is that sticking out like that? I don't quite understand what's happened here. I can't resize that. And I've got no hooks to hook this stuff into. Uh something going very wrong see all of these for some reason are being missized so I think whatever that SVG is it's um, it's missed, messed with it <laughs> so I can't connect this up Something seriously wrong here. See, why can't I can't connect this? All right, hold on. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna quit and then come back in. It seems to have got its knickers in a twist again. Uh, it definitely needs some work. I mean, we are working on night knees, of course. So we are kind of. Um, Yay, look, normal size is resumed, but I've got nothing to connect. Why doesn't it show me the ins and the outs of that? Oh. Hmm, okay. Uh, sorry. Minute. Uh, I've done, I've missed something out. Maybe it's because I didn't connect anything. Let me, right, let's, let's, let's just, this is un, unintuitive, this user interface I find as well. Let's just get rid of that. Right, let's just save. And let's just open the stepper block and make some changes here.
I haven't connected any of this, maybe that's why it's getting offended. It is very confusing, this thing. It's not straightforward at all. So if I... It's not necessarily intuitive, and I think if you know how to do it, then you probably have been through this curve and do it right. But for me, or anyone else for that matter, it might be a bit more difficult. So if I connect, connect these up, right? Yeah, why is it not? Do I have to go from out to in? Is that what it's got a problem with? If I connect these up now, uh, let's just straighten that up. Maybe because it didn't have anything connected, it doesn't show you those. And then inputs, let's just do some inputs. Right, and then let's save that project. Then let's open the module one that we were doing before. Get rid of that one so that you guys can see it on OBS. And then I'm going to import add as a block. Yeah, now we can see the connectors. So you have to have something connected, otherwise it doesn't seem to register. So Weezer learning slowly. Go away, telling me there's a new nightly version. Crikey, it's so persistent. Okay. Oh, look, it's doing the odd size thing again. Oh my God, that was really annoying. And the uh, right, so what was that? That was ten, one ten, if I remember, and that was B two. And that was a green underscore LED underscore green. Uh, so those can be wired up. Let's just forget the fact that it looks like a dog's dinner for the moment. So that will go bong, bing, bing, bong. That connects into there. And then we need a divider, don't we? So so normally you can just use the clock divider, but because I'm not using the same clock, Laurie, it makes it a bit more difficult. Um, so I'm just going to use one of these. Um, And I'm going to open it up. See, this already has clock in, and I can't seem to change that. Um, 
What if I unlock this? Can I show you that? I say clock. What happens if I do that? Clock name. Don't show clock. Okay. Clock in. Let's say clock. And clock out. Okay. Um, probably just fucked it up. To save your design, you need to lock the key lock and go to top level. You want to export this sub module. Okay. Save as okay. Can I copy that? Uh, clone. No. Keeps doing that. Why does it? So, so you can do it in a modular fashion. It's just tricky. I, it, you know, I think it gets easier once you get going, of course. And this one. Oops. And then I need to add the constants dividers. God, it's a little bit, um, Mickey Mouse. The only way of putting it, quite frankly. It's not necessarily intuitive. Um, Laurie is asking why a prescaler for direction? Why not bit? Well, uh, or maybe I got cut off. Maybe that's when the um, stream dropped. Basically, I just wanted to m move a number of steps and then change direction. Normally, it would be a bit. I'm just trying to automate the testing here so we can see what's going on. So that would 
probably be right. If we did a build, errors. <laughs> it doesn't let the prescale. What have I done? <clears throat> and Out. See, I don't know exactly what the error is. The trouble with the blocks, you can't actually error is detected. What is the error? I can't see what the error is. There's an error in there, but I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because... Why is that Z? Actually. N. <clears throat> Case sensitive. Why is it 22? 15 here. Maybe I need to call it N there. Okay. Right. Do I have to tick local parameter, maybe? No. Oh, if I know what that is. Oh, my word. Um, why is it called Z up there? Why does that say N22? Oh, uh, why does it have that? Shouldn't that just be whatever it is? Holy cow! I do not know, I really don't. Yeah, no, I think you're right, Laurie. It is. It's N on its side, rotated 90 degrees. That's why it looks like it's dead. Very confusing. But why does it say 22 up there? That's like really odd. Clock. Oh. I think I know what's going on here. I think it's because this needs to have a capital C. Let me try and lock it. Hold on. Is the same? Oh no! Fuck's sake! All right. So even though I've changed that one, it didn't change this for some reason. God, that's so annoying. Should reload it. 
and I can't double click on it. There are parts of this that are enormously frustrating. That's really the only way I could possibly describe it. Oh no, save as. How to do save as? Now do a build again. There are errors in the expected PCF syntax. See, this is one of those hidden things. I mean, where is that error? We can't see that. That's on the output somewhere. I mean, what the hell does that mean? It's had a problem with the PCF file. Set IO. Cell pin on line three. So it's created a PCF file, but it's I have no idea. Let's output the uh, Verilog and have a look. This is definitely trial by fire, guys. Oh my God. <laughs> Right, hold on. Uh, let me just Tenify Studio temporarily. So let's have a look at this file. It's saying what line three did it? It's a PCF file that it creates, and I don't know what that looks like. I need to output that. But look at what it's created. This is the thing that really winds me up. I mean, it is gobbledygook. How are you meant to understand this stuff? Is there any way of controlling this? I mean, what's all this stuff? The way it connects things together is really, really, makes it unreadable. Okay, let me just go back because um, there's an export for um, the PCF, I think, as well, which we need to look at because that's what it's getting the error. Export PCF. And let's open that. And the error it said was, I'll just remind you, uh, there are errors in the design, error expected, PCF syntax, set underscore IO cell pin on line three. It's because there's no pin number, look, on this first one. So I haven't set it in the design, clearly. So hold on, let's just go back. Oh, I don't know what that's meant to represent. So if we switch back on the design, what is that referring to? Which bit isn't defined? You know, we've defined what clock is, that's button three. We've defined, oh, that's wrong. That shouldn't be F100. That should be 1A9. Maybe that's what it's had a problem with. 10. Okay. Let's save that and let's rebuild. That's good. And let's. Um, yeah, it verifies. Bingo. If I export that again, 
It should have fixed that problem, shouldn't it? I'm just checking back on the file. Yeah, it's fixed it now. Okay. So yeah, you can do it by dragging and dropping it. <laughs> Although that was a trial by far. Yeah, the, the mistakes can be somewhat hidden away from you. You have to export like the Verilog file and see where the mistake is in the file or you have to export the PCF file in order to see the error that it's referring to because it's not always obvious. But in terms of assembling your parts up like this, that's where the advantage comes in, right? I guess, assuming you've got, you know, enough component pieces. It's not really for you as a designer, but it's for you using it as a library, I guess, that you can drag and drop these things. But really, it's just Verilog, and all you're doing is you're wiring modules together. But rather than using modules, you're using this thing called blocks, whatever that means. <clears throat> Dory says that is more useful than the original one. Yeah, sure. Um, but I am unconvinced about the usefulness of it generally well likewise and not only that it's just puzzling what the errors are and things i mean it is getting better and this is a nightly that we're working with which doesn't you know help we're more prone to the other issues but you know looking at that it looks more sensible as well and you can imagine if you're doing something online this is a better way of doing it if you're streaming and showing stuff then it makes sense but you've got to do it in a certain way i feel and you need to be familiar with doing it that way systematically so that people understand and you need to have some of these components pre-compiled because you can always go in and look at them i guess so I, presumably i can double click on that and i can go in and have a look so it's all there for me plus make changes etc so it's getting used to the order and way in which it's done, I think. It's it's basically it's like a a modular Verilog editor that leans on block parts as libraries. Yeah, as Laurie says, once you've learnt Verilog, wiring modules together is fairly trivial. It is, but for someone, you know, that's new to it, maybe, that doesn't have all that experience, they can come and start using modules, piecing them together, and then they can look at them, those modules. It, 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 you know, there's some value in it, but there's a, it's probably harder if you already know Verilog coming backwards and doing it this way because it doesn't kind of work the way exactly you'd expect it. You're kind of unlearning some stuff to a degree. Your mileage may vary, but um, interesting nevertheless. And it is starting to look, you know, I think... Um, nicer than it did before right <sighs> well I've been going for two and three quarters an hour which is a lot longer so we're probably I'm not gonna be able to do the end margin bit um, but we can do that next time um, and if anybody wants me to do any more of the uh, iStudio, please let me know. Because I'm now starting to get the hang of, I think, the hang of the way it works. And it could be a useful visual tool from a very long point of view, I guess. If nothing else, it looks pretty. Yeah, and it puts all the tools together. That, the other thing you've got to remember, Laurie, is 
you know, people don't necessarily have all the tools installed. And here, by just installing iStudio, I've got all the tool chain because it installs the APIO stuff. It enables me to select my board. The clock stuff is a lot easier than I showed you here because normally we use the default clock, which is defined in the board file. So you don't have to, you know, do this. And the prescaler stuff, you know, is a bit easier, I guess. But <coughs> I don't know, maybe we can do a bit more next time, something slightly more complicated and start to see what that looks like. But I also want to do the Mijin stuff as well. So the next part of the Mijin stuff is to make the changes so that we've got the direction like we have here in the Verilog in the iStudio version. Um, but also hook up um, a basic SPI as well. So one of the things we can do is provide step and direction signals from the microcontroller. So we can do that first. Um, that's fairly easy to do. Uh, and then the next thing is to add the SPI in. I think we can do that in one session, you know, maybe next Wednesday uh, for the next session. Um, that should be fairly easy. That's just joining up the parts that we've already made to a degree. And using a bit more, um, and using Circuit Python as well to talk to it, which is where the joined up bit comes in, which is kind of cool. And that joined up bit will work with both Engine Migin or iStudio, I guess. Oh, great, I'm getting tired now. So um, let's leave it at that. Let's wrap it up. Um, Anyone have any questions before I disappear off? No, no, maybe. Um, I guess not. I mean, we can carry on this conversation down at the forum anyhow. Um, and then perhaps do a bit more next week. But let me know what you think, guys, when you've seen this. Even if you're not doing a live stream, if you're catching the uh, uh, the uploaded version, which I'll get up probably in the morning. Um, let me know your thoughts. If you want to see more of this, less of this, etc., etc. I can combine this. It's quite good contrast as well. I think having the InMigen and the Verilog part as well. It's also useful from a uh examples point of view because we need to be build up the examples base um for the newer versions of the boards the alloy stuff so i can do that interactively as part of the stream and then i can create you know the nmigen library parts as well as the um possibly iStudio parts slash Verilog parts because they are like little Verilog parts as well. Um, okay, well, thank you for joining me, everyone. I'm glad it worked in the end. It took a bit longer than I thought to um, to get the stepper stuff done in the iStudio, but I think we have, I can see some of the benefits of how that would be for uh, the newcomers, and I don't mind doing a bit more of that alongside the MMIGEN just to make things a bit easier to see. And it's always good to see a comparison between the um, NMIGEN, the Python side of things and the Verilog side of things to see where the differences lie, etc. So um, come talk to us down at the forum. Give me the feedback. Um, otherwise, I will see everyone and any new people, perhaps, uh, on the next stream uh, on Wednesday. Thanks, guys.